it is my great pleasure to contribute to the MIT A plus B Applied Energy Symposium, which is co-organized with Harvard. Uh, at Yale, we have been thinking about light chemical conversion or light driven chemical production at scale. My name is Shu Hu. I'm at Yale Chemical Engineering and also affiliated with the Yale Energy Science Institute at West Campus. So the chemical production scale is directly related to long durational energy storage. Along these inspirational goals, my group have been thinking about two strategies. One is the direct water electrolysis from sunlight using photoelectrodes and photocatalyst. And the other one is to produce hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide from uh, available feedstocks like sunlight, water, and air. And we consider those as energy uh, carriers uh, for long durational storage. So combining both hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide, the reverse the direction for generating electricity or heat are considered has advantage of high energy density. And moreover, uh, there's a growing infrastructure for utilizing the hydrogen produced uh, for generating electricity back or generating heat. So therefore, we think that both are important energy carriers and intermediary chemical feedstock uh, for a sustainable and circular economy. And therefore, our efforts have been focusing on the solar light or generally light to chemical conversion. Uh, for these small molecules. So I will discuss the group's transition a couple of years ago from photoelectrochemical devices to photocatalysis for the important considerations of the scaling up. And here we consider um, the photocatalysts are typically particles, but they can be thin films and pan pan uh, planar panels. And their features are actually uh, making reductive reactions on co catalysts and oxidative reactions elsewhere um, happening simultaneously uh, in close proximity. Uh, but last but not least, I will also uh, tell you about our efforts in achieving electrocatalytic selective two electron water oxidation to produce hydrogen peroxide, which we consider an enabler to produce peroxide and hydrogen at the same time. And we think this is essential to a long duration of storage. And I just mentioned that this also have the important implications for reactor engineering, which you can produce gaseous hydrogen and liquid peroxide dissolving water, uh, which is safe. So a major contributions um, of our work to materials for photochemistry is the stabilization coating strategy as shown here. Um, so far, uh, we have uh, shown to stabilize the entire class of technologically important semiconductors, um, not only including a silicon group 3,5 materials like gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide, a, but also two six semiconductors that have been shown to be uh, manufactured at scale for thin film solar panels, including cadmium telluride, but also we have shown that the coatings have been extended to acidic conditions for acid stable water oxidation, as well as the wire structures, including the microscopic wires and also the nano wires that are grown on silicon in base. And all of them have shown up to 2000 hour stability and particularly recently, we show that even gallium arsenide and nanowires have shown 600 hour stability. And I think all these advances are thanks to the development of the stabilization coating for stabilizing the otherwise unstable semiconductor liquid junction. And that is, has been a challenge in the field. So with that, I think the currently the performance durability metric uh, for considering those interfaces is actually a thousand hours. So that is advancement. And I think we found that the reproducible and robust stabilization so far can only be achieved actually by a thick diffusion barrier layer here. And as shown here, this is the original, what we call leaky TL2. And we found that these kind of coatings, if you want to make it thick enough, but optically thin, 
um, you need to introduce a intermediate band and we call them intermediate band oxide, which actually has this electronic state in the otherwise forbidden band gap. And the original liquid TL2 has the TS3 plus defect states that forms this. And in the fact that these defect states were found to be actually aligning with uh, various semiconductor photoabsorbers, including silicon, gallium arsenide, and telluride. And actually in doing so, we can achieve a pretty high a, a performance. And this is actually thanks to these heterojunction structures uh, that the alignment of the energy states of the valence band with the intermediate band achieves the efficient charge separation. And therefore the accumulated holes will transport across the coating to the surface functionalized catalyst to drive water oxidation at high efficiency. And we think this uh, is uh, fairly general. So uh, why we think this is general? We have expanded the coating we call now uh, intermediate band coating 2.0. And essentially we introduce extrinsic dopants instead of uh, intrinsic dopants of TI3 plus. We introduce various transition metal oxides and our early transition metal oxides. And they have various energy states in the band gap of white band gap semiconductor, white band gap coatings like gallium, uh, like sorry, TiO2 and aluminum oxide. And we use the ALD atomic layer deposition super cycle synthesis, and we can control the single atom versus atom cluster dispersion in them. And a, we essentially, we uh, grow matrix of TL2, but also introduces the, um, so sparse um, deposited um, a, uh, extrinsic dopants like chromium or manganese in there. And actually we got the inspirations from the nature we got inspiration from the natural, natural gemstones. Um, rutile has, uh, because red, is because of chromium or iron in there. Um, but the uh, artificial rutile that we synthesize from here is chromium alloy TL2. And it has a hundred times more dense and grown at a much less uh, temperature than nature's red rutile. And in doing so, we make sure of the sufficient conductivity through the coating by utilizing the overlapping uh, energy states, electronic states across the coating thickness. And beside that, we have shown that if we change the chromium to manganese, we can control the energy level. We tune the intermediate band energy level in the middle of the band gap. And uh, that can reach to a deeper valence band, uh, such as even wider uh, photoabsorbers like gallium phosphide. Okay, so with all that consideration, all these coatings will be applied to the uh, photoabsorbers uh, for photocatalysis uh, later on in the talk. And um, but before that, let's put into uh, the scale perspective. Of course, ALD coating is possible with row-to-row -row manufacturing. So therefore, the challenge here would be the scalable manufacturing of the semiconductor photoabsorber. To obtain a hundred kilogram of hydrogen or hydrocarbon equivalent, which is useful for powering one hydrogen semi-truck or a residential courtyard, one would need a football field to run at least 12% efficiency every day for seven years. So on the other hand, the cost is due to the expensive semiconductor and balance of system is also pretty high. In comparison, the industrial CSTR can output hydrogen uh, by, for example, using catalytic cracking at this throughput easily. But we also, but still, the kind of demonstrations we have for photoelectrochemical devices or photocatalysis so far um, is quite low not even close. So how should we bridge the gap here? So if we can do so, we can really make particles, a wet coat them onto a substrate row to row and make large um, panels, make large uh, device demonstrations for uh, photocatalysis. We can think about a tandem uh, compartment 
One is producing hydrogen or CO2 reduction fuels like CO, and the other one is the making oxygen. And the redox mediators will shuttle the two in between, and I'll show you later an example how we are going toward that direction. And furthermore, we can incorporate the direct air capture of um, CO2 in a form of carbonates or bicarbonates and input that into the fuel generation reactor and using the in situ produce the protons to acidify the local solutions, release the CO2, and therefore the CO2 can reduce, be reduced to CO. So with all that considerations, I think the basic fundamental questions to ask is how to actually systematically show that a photo absorber can be converted from a photoelectrode, which is only one half reaction, into a photocatalysis, which is the two half reactions occurring simultaneously on the same liquid interface. And so far, only strontium titanate oxide, that is strontium titanate photocatalysts, um, they are the model systems they've been shown and to be deployed at scale, but the energy efficiency is only less than 1%. So the, the research question is, could it be possible for us to apply coatings to semiconductor particles or panels so that we can achieve this reductive co-location of the reductive and oxidative reactions at close proximity along the same liquid junction interface? which we define as photocatalysis. So it doesn't matter if it's a particle or panel or thin film, but it has to be co-evolving uh, hydrogen and oxygen or co-evolving hydrogen and oxidizing redox mediator. And how do we do that? And furthermore, uh, we really want to show that uh, the catalyst needs to be uh, really selective, uh, not in terms of the chemical production selectivity, but also um, the selectivity towards the re-reduction of the redox mediator. So you don't want to have the re-reduction of the redox mediator happening at the fuel forming reactions. Otherwise, the photocatalyst doesn't have a high quantum efficiency overall. Okay. So with all that considered, I think the challenge here is how to achieve that, how to bridge the efficiency gap for the uh, photocatalyst, okay? And um, the photocatalysis field has been advanced by trial and error. There have been so much work on this and we have seen steady state increase in efficiency, but still mostly it's less than 1%. The fundamental research question to ask is how does particles work? How does the charge separation work? How does the charge separation couple with the inefficient kinetics and the transport surrounding the photocatalyst? Does size matter? Uh, in that case, what is the optimal size? Does doping matter? In that case, is n-type doping better or p-type? Or is high doping better or low doping better? So what is the doping design principle? for those photocatalysts. So one thing we notice is that if we think about a photocatalyst and draw the band bending diagram as in a photoelectrode, actually photocatalyst doesn't work that well because the electrons would accumulate in the middle in this U-shaped valley and the holes will go to the side and you don't have the, um, what we consider a necessary co-location of the reductive and oxidative reactions at the spatially separated sites and accumulated there. Um, so if we cannot achieve that, I think the charge separation um, is problematic. But, but the band bending is symmetric. And even with the small particles like 100 nanometers of micron, as we know, it could be fully depleted in the liquid. So how do we achieve a directional charge transport and separation here? So we took a different route. Um, we built a model system of the photocatalyst starting from silicon all the way to strontium titanate, tandem nitride. And now we're building that onto two, six and three, five semiconductors. And we developed a model photocatalyst understanding the charge separation mechanism that are coupled with the surface energetics and charge transfer kinetics. We show that all these are 
like um, interlocked gears that uh, they are mutually dependent with each other. But we found that it's interesting that a small asymmetric band bending energetics are sufficient to drive the charge separation so that a big photovoltaic can be produced because of the band gap of the photoabsorber as well as the redox potentials, redox couples available at the solid liquid interface. Okay. So we apply this to the coating protected photoabsorbers in the form of particles or thin films or panels. And we start to show that this is, would be a general strategy for coatings to achieve effective local charge separation for photocatalytic coevolution. And we take the cadmium selenide, the cadmium sulfide, sorry, commercial particles as the model system. We grow ALD coatings on top of it, it's a leaky TL2. And we deposit, photo deposit, the co catalyst with a selective uh, core shell structures um, to achieve the efficient charge separation. And here we go. So this is the, the CDS particles on panels. We can co-evolve hydrogen and also in the meantime, oxidizing the sulfide into polysulfide. Uh, the charge separation is in close proximity across uh, tens to hundred nanometers. And we can achieve pretty high quantum efficiencies and um, overall high hydrogen, solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency. So we took the panel and we'll place it into a redox mediated photocatalytic reactor. So in this case, uh, we used a, a hydrogen evolution is from one compartment, and oxygen evolution is from another compartment. For simplicity, we just use a solar cell to drive the redox mediated generation. But of course, in the future, we can replace this with another photocatalyst that produces oxygen and uh, also uh, regenerate the redox mediator. So, so far we have shown that uh, two to one molar ratios for hydrogen oxygen. Actually, the hydrogen oxygen are generated not just in two different locations, but also at uh, two different times. So we can produce hydrogen when there's light and we can also produce oxygen uh, in the middle of the evening for the energy stored or we can um, regenerate it whenever necessary. So the redox mediator would be like energy storage media uh, as the working fluid. So for this particular demonstration, um, this gas evolution rate is equivalent to solar to hydrogen conversion efficiency of 1.7%. And that is already higher than the demonstrated panel using strontium titanium. And with a three panel stacking of only the CDS material itself, the solar to hydrogen efficiency can reach to 5.9%. And we've shown that. So here, we also show that in this video, this can run for as long as 150 hours for using the only three nanometer TL2 coated photo absorber. And furthermore, uh, we show that with the, without the coating, actually it doesn't work that well. It's only a few hours it will die. And using XPS, we have showed that the surfaces is really with the improved stability because um, with the coating, uh, we cannot see a pronounced uh, SOx uh, sulfur oxide peak indicating of the photo corrosion, um, but well, without the coating, actually, we can see the pretty pronouncedly. And furthermore, we found that of course the uh, efficiency actually goes down over time, but we find that it's not related to the photo absorber, actually, just related to the chromium oxide shell. I will later show how this loss of the chromium oxide shell and the selectivity actually affects the overall stability, okay? So, but let's just uh, keep going. And I'm going to show you that the coated gallium indium phosphide, uh, that material, it has a lower band gap. Now it's a 1.8 electron volts. And we can show on a planar panel of a thin film epitaxial grown gallium indium phosphide, we can achieve the same kind of charge separation on the top surface. So on the top surface, we have two kinds of sites. And one site has a high barrier height of about 0 0.68 volts. And the other site has a lower barrier height about 0 0.14 volts. And although these are fairly small, we can actually measure them correctly. 
And we show that both in experiment and the semiconductor modeling, that this small difference is about 0.5 volts of the difference. Usually you want to have it as high as possible, even as high as a band gap of 1.8. But in this case, only as small as 0.5 volts of the difference is sufficient to drive very efficient charge separation of quantum efficiencies over 60%. And we, we show that. So we think that this kind of a coating stabilized photoabsorber is working at a completely different regime as compared to the photoelectrochemical or photoelectrocatalytic energy conversion. And you don't need to have a high barrier height difference, but of course the hydrogen evolution and oxygen evolution, they are co-located at a close proximity and we need to have a, a new thinking about how to design um, those photocatalysts. And all these are based on our fundamental understanding of this um, solid liquid interface. Essentially for photocatalyst, the semiconductor liquid junction are fairly complex, okay? Here we show a three-dimensional graph. Along the liquid interface, you would have spatially varying energetics. And because of that under sunlight illumination, this spatially varying energetics will create the electron accumulating site and hole accumulating site respectively. And each of the site will drive their respective reductive and oxidative reactions. So the charge can be separated laterally. Second, there's a selective charge transfer needed. So you don't want to have the reductive site actually re-reducing the products. You don't have the oxidative side re-oxidizing the product. And not only so, the kinetics and energetics are highly mutually dependent, which means if you have the unwanted kinetics, the energetics will be changed. And therefore you wouldn't have as big of the charge separation as possible because the energetics difference between the two sides are different. So that's very sensitive. So that means that if the kinetics are not tuned well due to the local catalysis, the energetics are not favorable anyway, and therefore your charge separation is not good. So actually the charge separation affects the kinetics, but the kinetics also in return affects the charge separation as well. So that's what I mean by the interlocked gears and mutually dependence among all these factors. And we show that this actually is general, it's related to various kinds of semiconductor photoabsorbers. It has to be low doping. And we want to test this hypothesis we did talk about in two experiments. The first one is that we showed only with the chromium oxide coating on the rhodium, we have the kinetic selectivity achieved for the energetic difference enough to drive the charge separation. And because the energetic difference is so small, it's only less than 0.5 volts, for semiconductor absorbers, that's enough to drive se charge separation. But on the other hand, it, has, it, it is also very sensitive to the charge separation efficiency. If a small change of the energetic difference across the reductive oxidative site, then the charge separation efficiency will change by a lot. So that's also a different scenario compared to the photoelectrocatalysis. And we show that because we have measured the energetics at the liquid interface locally uh, by building model systems, so we have back contact to sense the electrochemical potentials of electrons and holes, right? And we can measure the kinetics by using well-defined um, mixture of gases of hydrogen and oxygen. So we can measure the rate um, and for each of the reactions, hydrogen evolution and oxygen reduction. And in doing so, we can show a systematic trend of the band bending and charge separation efficiency related to the energetic difference. So, and we invoke the detailed balance and the macroscopic reversibility to show that uh, we can extend the semiconductor liquid junction theory for photo electrocatalysis to photocatalyst where the semiconductor is interfacing two, at least two redox, redox couples at the liquid junction. 
So we show all that, and we also show that this is general applicable to gallium phosphide. And we have to have this selective layer to control the kinetics and energetics and the extent of the asymmetric energetics at the liquid junction interface so that we can achieve high efficiency for gallium in the phosphide as well. So to put into the numbers perspective, uh, we have shown that if you do the CDS three panel stack, you get 5.9%. And if we use the gallium indium phosphide, you got 9.4% solar to hydrogen efficiency in a redox mediated water splitting photocatalytic reactor. Okay. So now we switch gears. We have so far showed this panel base, the particle base, and coating stabilized photocatalysis. And all these are thanks to the manipulation of the local lateral charge uh, separation. So can we apply this to a, another uh, chemistry? So in this case, we, we focus on the coevolution of hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide. And it has two advantages. One is that the, the cell potential is higher because the redox mediated redox potentials related to the water oxidation to hydrogen peroxide is 1.7 uh, volt. So that, that means the full cell potential is 50% higher than water splitting cells. And furthermore, if we can develop a multifunctional coatings that not only protect the semiconductor photoabsorbers in uh, near, near, near neutral pH conditions, but also can produce this hydrogen peroxide uh, selectively by water oxidation, then we can combine hydrogen evolution and hydrogen peroxide and to generate the two useful chemicals under sunlight at the same time. And our modeling have shown that you can actually achieve up to 20% by using one photoabsorber. So why hydrogen peroxide is also interesting, it's been used mostly recently with water, wastewater treatment and the sterilization of the pathogenic SARS-CoV-2. So the controlled peroxide deposition, not only for the water treatment disinfection, but also it can be used to convert to the chemical energy into the kinetic energy across various scenarios, ranging from the propellants for rockets, race cars, to for fuels for robots, soft mechanics, and self-propelled rockets. <coughs> Excuse me. The energy relevance for hydrogen peroxide is that the storage of hydrogen peroxide doesn't require pressurization or cryogenic temperatures. The only necessary precaution, and this is well known in the peroxide chemical industry, is that it avoids UV and avoids iron, period. So I think that can be pretty well controlled. So therefore, the peroxide has the potential to be a sustainable and green medium for long duration storage. That's why my students are really excited about um, this direction. So can we integrate hydrogen evolution and the peroxide together? So we're working on that. But first of all, we've identified uh, in this review paper that the mechanism of the two electron selective water oxidation is very complex. And the electrocatalytic synthesis of hydrogen peroxide through two electron pathways is actually quite challenging. And the, the main reason is because the, re, the potentials for two electrons is always 500 millivolts higher than the water oxidation to oxygen. So we have to think about strategies while producing the peroxide very efficiently and hopefully at the near the thermodynamic potential, but also in the meantime to suppress the oxygen evolution kinetics so they can easily dominate under any potentials that could drive peroxide production, right? And the photocatalysis actually produce a good opportunity because you can fix the water oxidation energy levels by fixing the bend edge positions. You can select the redox potentials for what works and what not. So you can tune the energetics between the peroxide and the, the radicals formation so that you can avoid the radical induced disproportionation reactions. And furthermore, the surface chemistry design is important because the produced peroxide needs to leave the surface effectively and materials like KL2 and tin oxide would be well-desorbing the peroxide producer that 
the react the products doesn't poison the catalyst. So to consider all these, and we have utilized the coatings we have made before the manganese alloy, the TL2. It is TL2 surface rich and has a manganese intermediate band in there. And the manganese are subsurface and can provide the electron transfer uh, uh, energy levels. But also we found that the catalytic reactions of water oxidation start to turn on right after the 1.76 volts versus Rg, which is the thermodynamic potential. And we don't see current at all, actually, before this potential. So that's interesting. And this is actually, we found about this for various super cycle ratios of TiO2 versus manganese oxide growth. And this seems to be a wide range of the composition we can achieve the high selectivity. And to put into the perspective of what is dying in the field, many of the published work in the field actually talks about the high selectivity, but all of them actually occurs at a pretty high over potentials, much higher than actually what we found before. And with a small over potential, actually, um, you start to ramp up the fardic efficiency uh, to a, a high value, but the high value of the fardic efficiency cannot be achieved at low over potentials for many of the reported work. And here we show that actually with a fire efficiency quantification, the peroxide generation actually uh, can start as low as 50 millivolts and the fire efficiency is already over 90%. So that is a really a promising directions for us to think about how to integrate the TIA manganese oxide with the uh, co-evolution for the catalysis scheme. And of course, we think about why this is the case. And this is really what we are quite excited about is trying to combine the thinkings of the electronic structure at a solid liquid interface with electrocatalysis. We think that this kind of coating is not a typical metallic electrocatalyst. We think it's a semiconductor electrocatalyst. And the Conduction band and valence band is done by the TL2, but we also have an intermediate band. When you apply the potential, actually, we make the band bending, but the energy levels of the uh, relevant to the peroxide production actually are pinned to the solid liquid interface. And we're using operando XPS to try to understand and try to review the potential dependent energetics here now. And our hypothesis is that the potentials are relevant to selective hydrogen peroxide production actually. It is controlled by the applied potential and it's tuned by this manganese alloy TL2, its specific energy levels of the intermediate band so that it achieves the right energy levels and the right conductivity for the high fire efficiency of water oxidation to hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so uh, to conclude, we think that the particulate photocatalysis with co-evolving of redox oxidative reactions is necessary and important for solar energy conversion and scale. We use the CDS and gallium phosphate to show that. We showed a redox mediator mediated photoreactor that achieved co-evolution. And furthermore, we have moving towards the direction of making a co-evolution of liquid and gas products that are separating themselves at the same time and uh, the make, which makes the reactor safe. Okay, so there's a lot of work to do, um, but here I really want to thank um, my group, very enthusiastic, uh, really uh, respectful group of people, and especially uh, Dr. Tian Shuo Zhao and Dr. Zhen Hua Pan who have taken an effective position right now. And I also want to thank uh, the many really helpful and inspiring collaborators um, for me, um, and a, including uh, Professor Doman, Professor Orsolo at Davis, and Professor Thomas Hannapel in Germany at the TU Imanol, as well as uh, Professor Batcher, Professor Brutbeck, and Batista. Funding for this started with the Tomcat Foundation Geo Energy Science Institute 
And recently, I'd like to thank the Office of Naval Research for coding support, as well as the Research Corporation Sloan Foundation and Tristel Down Foundation for the photocatalyst work. And thank you so much for listening to this.